Jeremy, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know this is not your first time to the festival, but how is it to be back in Chalk Valley? Uh, very nice, rather wet. Rather wet. Jolly good, yeah. Now, before touching on the Great War, we must discuss the last seven days and the last broadcast you gave at Newsnight after 25 years. I mean, has it quite sunk in yet that you've left behind such a huge part of your life? I suppose it has, yeah. 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 I, yeah. <laughs> it's rather good waking up in the morning and not feeling it. You need to read all the papers and listen to the news and stuff. Absolutely. And the send-off with Boris Johnson must have been particularly um, fitting. Was it? <laughs> well, I mean, did you enjoy it with Boris? Yeah, I mean, I always find talking to Boris a laugh. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's described you as the landmark of our culture. <laughs> Boris talks an awful lot of bollocks, you know. <laughs> But, I mean, do you relish this role now that you've, you've built up, you know, as the Grand Inquisitor, the landmark of our cultures? Well, yeah, I, yes, I don't think one wants to take these things too seriously. I mean, you just, any fool can ask questions, can't they? Well, <laughs> I hope, let's hope so. Well, um, yes, <laughs> we're going to find out now. <laughs> yeah. Off you go. Right, exactly. So, let's talk about the Great War. Um, I mean, obviously, when you sat down to, to write about it, were you daunted by the task of dealing with such a huge subject that's been covered so many times Yes, before. of course. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, you know, it, it is this so-called war to end war is a huge subject. And I think the big difficulty is that, you know, I grew up aware of what members of my family had done in the war and, and those who hadn't come back. And the big difficulty I think now is that it's moved from family recollection to history and that makes it much more difficult I think to make real so I think that was the, the for me that was the challenge in writing the book you know. I mean do you think our approach now to World War One is coloured by programmes like Blackadder, musicals yeah of like, course it um, is yeah I mean so that's something you, fa you found you had to combat have you read the book <laughs> I've watched the programmes and I've very I've <laughs> okay, that, that wasn't my question. My question well, is whether you've read the book. You haven't read the book. I haven't have, read. I've you're read a, a disgrace. Well, do my research. That's <laughs> yeah, the first you, thing. First thing, do your homework. Yeah. <laughs> but I've watched the programmes, which were terrific. All right. Okay. Can't Charm you? Can't you read? I'm going on the charm <laughs> offensive now. <laughs> this this <is> my tactic. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, do do you think that that's that's something? Of course. Yeah. Do. These. Th of course. The problem is, and and I, I, it was true of myself too before I started doing the research, that, 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 that our ideas about the First World War are not actually based upon the war itself. They're based upon the interpretations of the war, which begin to emerge actually in the 1920s, then through the 30s and Lloyd George's memoirs and so on. And then you get into the, right into the 60s, you get Alan Clark's book, The Donkeys, you get Britain's War, war Requiem, which brought Wilfred Owen's poetry to so many people. Oh, what a lovely war and eventually you get up to Blackadder and beyond. So that these are not ideas that are based upon the experience of the war itself. There are ideas that are based upon the interpretations of people who came later. Mm. And what I want to do is go back to the, you know, the original material. I mean, one of the great images in your book, um, which Which is, you have read. Which I have read. Which no, I you haven't read it. <laughs> What, you but, looked at the pictures? <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my starting point, is the three women with parasols on the beach. Yeah, you have looked at the pictures, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is with the newspaper boy in the background. Yes, um, war declared war, official. War declared official, and that's emblematic of, you know, the idea that people were oblivious to... They were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in 1914, people were aware of the rivalry with Germany, of course. The Germans, and particularly expressed through the Kaiser, were very, very preoccupied with getting what they saw as their just desserts in the world, and they wanted so-called a place in the sun. You know, they wanted something approximating to the empires that Britain and France both had, the British having much the larger one, of course. Uh, and so they were aware of that rivalry, but the real immediate threat to peace and tranquility was said to be not anything happening on the continent but what was happening in Ireland mm. and what was to be done about the unionists in Ireland who wanted to remain part of the 
United Kingdom and the Irish nationalists who wanted independence. That was seen to be the, the, the real challenge. And so it, when it came, this damn fool thing in the Balkans, it, it, you know, it came out of the blue. So I mean, why do you think we did fight for it? I mean, does, do you think the British soldier was particularly resilient and disciplined? And they were a lot better than many others. I mean, there was no there was no proper mutiny in the British Army in the in the way that there was, for example, in the French Army and indeed in the German Army in the latter stages of the war. Um, I think, obviously, the initial naive enthusiasm for enlistment did not last and couldn't last. Many many thousands joined up in the early months of the war and they didn't know what they were getting into. But that soon gave way to a, to a knowledge of what was involved. But you must remember that most people did not serve in frontline trenches. There's an enormous logistical tail in any military operation. And so they didn't all serve in frontline trenches. The experience of the war was known to everybody. And to be brutally frank about it, although it was bloody dangerous, parts of it you know, you can find plenty of accounts of people who say it's actually quite f fun. Mm. Yeah. When you're not terrified and unhappy, and it, you know, if you're not serving in a bit of Flanders with a very high water table and, and yeah. you're wet all the time, yeah. it's, it's actually, it wasn't that bad. Because it, what it gave them was an amazing sense of companionship. And that, I think, is the key to it. Yeah. That once you were in it, you didn't want to let down your mates. That's why I think they kept faith with it. And then after the war itself, um, do you think Britain changed? It was a huge turning point for Britain. I mean, the glorious past. Yes, it was. Yeah. And do you think it was? You know. I think it's turn? the big event in in modern British history. Yeah. Mm. I think that. You know, if you were a Victorian time traveller and you came back in 1914, early 1914, and you looked at Britain you would understand exactly how it worked. But if you came back in 1924, you wouldn't understand how it worked. And the country had been completely transformed, I think. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much for your time. Before you it's go... It's a pleasure. Um, how, would you, how would you say I've done on this interview compared to... Well, I would say it was even worse than last time. <laughs> so you're not going to be picking I gave up. you one out of ten last time. I gave you zero this time because you haven't done any homework at all. <laughs>